so yeah, no, can see it. <laughs> nice to meet you all guys uh, again just over zoom so a bit more a bit different but um good to good to see you all um so i'll be looking at a small side of games today and just looking at kind of the the variables that affect the physical tactical and technical outcomes in particular and how we can kind of adapt and manipulate small sided games to kind of get the outcomes you want really so just quickly i won't bore you with this but a little bit of background about myself so uh, i've did my bachelor's degree in sports science at Durham University, uh, did a master's degree at University of West of Scotland from distance and in Glasgow, and now just starting off a PhD at Liverpool John Moore. So that's kind of been my education side of things. And then from a professional standpoint, I'm a sports scientist by trade. So uh, I started off at Silvet Football Club in Switzerland. So um, that was there in the Swiss Super League at the moment. So great experience. It was um, about five years ago now. So again, I've had quite a, quite a few clubs in the meantime, just uh, moved around, but which has been good. Uh, again, I went to another club. It was kind of a part-time role. So it was a working as like the head sports scientist for a, a team in Switzerland as well at the same time. So that was uh, interesting to juggle the two. And then after that, I moved over to Poland. So uh, I worked with uh, Lechia Gdansk, so a team in the Polish uh, Super Bowl Premier League, uh, Extra Klaza. Again, really good experience. It was like 40, 50,000 fans every week. It was, it was crazy. So it was really, really interesting. And some big players that, were, uh, that played there as well. And then again, sorry, sorry that's not moving. There we go. <laughs> uh, then the next one, I moved over to China. So I uh, was, again, really good cultural experience as well as a professional. So I moved over there and worked with um, Chris Coleman and Kit Simmons in their coaching staff. And again, got the opportunity to work with players like Javier Mascherano and Lavezzi and few other Brazilian like Brazilian called Hernanes, like some big players. So it was great to great to learn from them. Uh, and then finally uh, at Cardiff after that. So I, I was working there as the lead academy sports scientist. So again, gave me a good understanding of uh, the kind of needs for the under 23 academy players to what they need to do to get into the first team really. So again, that's that's my background. I won't bore you with it anymore. Um, so now just starting off with small sided games really. So as probably you all know, really, it's a really popular training method used across professional and sort of recreational, recreational settings. Um, again, just a brief overview, just their small sided games pretty much are just smaller versions of the game itself, but just adjusting the numbers and the players, so the formats and the size of the field, really. Um, as probably you all know as well, it's many influential coaches and managers who are really key advocates of small sided games and kind of using them as game-based conditioning in a way because they really allow for the development of tactical, technical, physical and psychological factors sort of all together. So some of the big ones really, Jose Mourinho when he first came to the UK back when he was at Chelsea was a big advocate of that. He removed the, the running drills in pre-season and brought the balls out and started playing small-sided games pretty much straight from pre-season which was unheard of at the time in the UK. And then obviously the people that have worked with him and his kind of understanding of the game. So they've kind of followed that similar path. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this quote, but again, it could be controversial to some, but I think it's quite interesting and it's a good way of looking at the game. So basically he's suggesting that the best way to be a good footballer really is to play. So try and take out things in isolation and bring them more holistically together. So that's what small sided games are really good at, bringing all the different factors together to kind of develop players really. So again, small sided games really uh, are represented in different formats. So, but particularly a group by size and player numbers. So we've got the small sided games. So small, small sided games, if you want to call them that, like they're the smaller pitch areas, 1v1s to 4v4s. Uh, then the medium size, so increasing the size a little bit more and 5v5 to 8v8s. And then finally the large sided games, which are pretty much uh, almost full pitch, uh, 9v9 to 11v11 again some debate over like the 8v8, 9v9s and the 4v4, 5v5s if they're small, big, large, but kind of the general gist it's that. Again, like we said, uh, small-sided games are great to develop the all different aspects of the game, but what's good about small-sided games in particular is that you can manipulate them, uh, the different formats, and then manipulate also key kind of external variables, and they give you different tactical, physical, technical, and, and as well as psychological aspects and outcomes from them as well. So based off that, small-sided games are really key weapons for coaches when designing your training session. 
Uh, but how can small-sided games really be manipulated to achieve your individual goals? So again, I'm just going to throw this out there. These are all the kind of predominantly the major variables that affect small-sided games. So again, in this presentation, I'm not going to go over all of them because that'll take ages. I'm going to pick a couple, uh, the more important ones, and just go through them. But again, here's a couple little quotes as well that kind of explain how they're useful for small-sided games and the kind of the effect that they have on um, kind of the outcomes really as well. So uh, I'm going to particularly focus on pitch sizes, player numbers, and the kind of sets and reps really, and then a few of the rule modifications as well after that. So if we start with pitch sizes, again, how does a pitch size, affecting the pitch size, uh, affect the outcomes of a small-sided game? So again, very basic, but here we have three different um, games. So all of them are 4v4s, but all of them on different size pitches. So as you can see, just visually, each one, you're increasing the, the kind of the space for the players on each one and getting larger and larger, really. So again, you might all already do this already, but I thought just to kind of get a little reminder for everyone. But again, you don't need any technology really for this, just Excel or something to do the calculations. But what's really useful for calculating your pitch sizes and working out what's useful for your small sided games is particularly these three calculations so you're looking at your length times width for your kind of pitch area or size that's obviously a crucial one then looking at pitch density so that's the the pitch size divided by the amount of players in the uh, in the area really and then sort of a fairly new um, approach as well as looking at the relative area per player so like how much area does each player have on that particular pitch so that you can't see very well but that's a square root of the pitch density so that's something you could do in Excel or uh, externally really but if we go from that um, we can have a look at the different sizes and what they represent really so gradually increasing the pitch size you can see that the density increases as well as well as the relative area per player so the small one is fairly common for a 4v4 and then the medium one, again, fairly common as well. But then that very large one, the space is massive. So the relative area per player is almost the same as a full game. So the intensity would be very high in terms of that. And you wouldn't really see a full before in that space particularly. So if we look at kind of the, the positives in a way of small sided games, the very small ones we've seen in the top left. In the small spaces, you're going to get more touches, more passes, more dribbling. So in small spaces, dribbling and interceptions and blocks. Um, again, that's from this kind of small spaces. You're going to get more shooting as well and more goals because it's such a small space. Like if you've seen any small-sided games, players are shooting as soon as they get the ball sometimes, so there's much more shooting. Um, then again, the kind of speed of play of the small-sided games is quicker, especially if we, you get players to kind of feed the balls in. That means that um, you can kind of increase the speed of play and really get the, the play going quicker. And then from a kind of negative or like the stuff that you, you don't really get from the small spaces. So you're not getting that opportunity for players to run with the ball because the space is too small. Uh, less ball possession because the, the pressure on players from opponents is much higher. So it's a much smaller space. So players are more likely to press each other quicker. So you're getting less ball possession. And again, the kind of tactical roles, uh, there aren't really any tactical roles in a small side of game because it's so small. And again, just the reverse really for the large spaces. So not particularly this one in particular, but the kind of larger spaces. There's more opportunity to run with the ball. There's more ball possession because you've got more time on the ball. There's less pressure from opponents. So again, players kind of revert more to those sort of tactical roles as the, the pitches get bigger. There's more time and then the intensity really drops a little bit lower, but not too much in particular when they're large. And then you're not getting that same speed of play and those as many shooting opportunities really. So going from there, this again might look a bit complicated, but I'll break it down as simply as possible. Um, it's the high speed running. So which is like a fast jog really. And that's how the intensity of the high speed per minute. And then on the other side is the area per player. So that relative area per player size. So um, again, each white dot represents a drill and then the kind of sizes and then the high speed element kind of uh, shows you the kind of space the players have to run into. So if we've got an example, we'll use that little dot in the corner there. That would represent a 2v2. So a very small area, not as much space for the players to run into at high speed. 
So you're not going to get that high speed um, element to it. You'll get that short, sharp turning, dribbling, changing direction, but you won't get that long distance running with the ball. Whereas in the sort of top corner, we've got an 11 v 11 game. So that's a big space and a huge relative area for players. So a lot more opportunity to run with the ball, really. Okay, so moving on, looking at player numbers. So how does changing the player numbers affect the outcomes? So again, using fairly simplistic example, but using the same pitch size, you can see gradually as you increase the player size, uh, so the, the player numbers, the actual space decreases significantly. So a normal common 4v4 in that sort of space is fairly normal in the first one, but as you increase the size, it gets smaller and smaller. So it becomes more and more difficult to play, more pressure, and kind of lose that element of, um, of, of speed of play and of game, really, because the space is so small. So again, like we can see the pitch size stays the same in the density, but the area gradually gets smaller and smaller for the players to play. And so a 7v7 in that space is the same area pretty much as a 2v2, really, relative. So it's very small. So it's not gonna, you're not going to get the same benefits from it, really. Um, then again, if we're using floaters and unbalanced formats, so say a 4v4 plus 2 or um, a 5v4 or a 6v4, anything like that, what kind of benefits do we get or what's the differences really? So you're going to get more kind of cooperative actions. So you're kind of more as well, more sort of game realistic imbalances. So naturally in the game, you're going to get op uh, opportunities uh, attacking or defending where you're going to be. Uh, inferior or superior to the opposition. So fight, like we said, 5v4s or 4v6s, for example. So with the influence of floaters and unbalanced formats, you get that as well, which is a good part of the small side of games. And again, something to consider when planning them. But then one, maybe say a negative side of things or a slightly different side of things is the reduced aggressive actions, really. So if you've got, a this is particularly with floaters, their kind of demands are reduced because they're sort of sat in the middle really and they're working with both teams. So you're not getting as many aggressive kind of dribbles or duels or contacts as you would do without them really. And then if we're looking at the kind of unbalanced formats in more detail from kind of a tactical perspective, the teams that are in, in inferiority, uh, the physical demands are much higher because they're having to work much, much harder within the, the smaller space. Uh, and then also kind of that high inferiority, it promotes a little bit more organization. So if like the example, this is from some research papers, that if you have a seven attacking for like attacking seven versus a defending four, the four are naturally going to go a little bit more defensive and try and organize themselves because they're so outnumbered. Whereas on the other hand, if you're in superiority, you've got more opportunities to attack, more attacking finalization, uh, finalization opportunities, sorry and more shooting and scoring really. So if we bring that together and look at the pitch sizes and player numbers, we've got here, like, again, this is from the research that we've looked into as well as just developing over time. You then kind of, as you understand pitch sizes and player numbers a bit more, you have a good understanding of what kind of is a small, medium and large really, and like what format suits um, what size really. So gradually, by developing, having a better understanding of that, you can start to develop your own sort of drill libraries and get a good idea of what each drill is. And again, you don't need any kind of like fancy technology for this, just like maybe a session planner where you can plot the sessions and then just making sure you make note of each one and then gradually get in an understanding of, oh, that was a big 4v4 or that was a small 5v5 or anything like that really. So definitely important to consider that when planning your player numbers and pitch sizes. So if we just go from there to look at the kind of intensity. So this was from a bit of research and the heart rates on the left and the pitch size on the right, uh, on the bottom right. So from this research, the kind of 1v1 to 3v3 formats, um, the intensity is really high. So you can probably see from the data, it's higher than match intensity. So because of the intensity is so high, um, as you reduce, as you increase the player number size, so when you get to four v fours and five v fives, which are more medium sized games, the intensity drops a little bit. So, suggests that those high intensity efforts uh, are greater in the smaller games, really. But then, from that perspective, if you increase the size of the pitch but keep the player numbers, the intensity actually increases. So, 
Again, that may be fairly self-explanatory because it's smaller area, but as you increase the area but keep the players, they've got more space that they have to run into. So more pressure on players, they have to run to get closer to players when if it's a little bit smaller, uh, it's less pressure, really. So again, it all really depends as well on the formats you use. Then if we look at kind of technical actions, this is again from the research, they found that as the playing areas and numbers decreased, the actual dribbling opportunities, so more so running with the ball really uh, increased. So again, it's not running with the ball over long distances, it's over shorter distances, but there was more kind of individual technical actions in the smaller more smaller games, which obviously makes more sense because it's 1v1s or 2v2s, you haven't really got those passing opportunities. Uh, whereas once you increase the size of the pitch, there's more kind of collective technical actions. So players have less time on the ball. So as you gradually increase, you kind of get less of those technical, individual technical actions. So then on to kind of like the tactical side of things. Again, as the players, as the sort of player area increases, as well as the player numbers, naturally you get a little bit more game realism. So it's becoming a little bit more game realistic based on the kind of organization aspect of it. You get more cooperation with teammates. There's less need to run with the ball really and perform individual technical actions. So generally the lower kind of, the lower games are the small, small sided games, more intense, more technical actions in a short period of time. And then gradually as you increase, particularly um, towards like the 11 side games, you're getting more sort of tactical roles being played and more sort of organization and game realism really. Again, so after we look at just we set some reps, so um, how does a set the sets and reps and the work to rest ratios you use in small sided games affect the physical, technical and tactical outcomes? So this is again based on some research that people did with 6v6 uh, plus goalkeepers. So they looked at different formats. So from sort of more interval, which is like shorter periods. So like four, four reps, uh, sorry, four sets of two minutes. So quite short repetitions to gradually increase it to a continuous eight minute block. So they looked at kind of blocking off eight minutes and how that had an effect on uh, physical, technical and tactical outcomes. So as we can see, that's the kind of the, the, the dimensions and the format used. So from a kind of psychological perspective, the players in this study found it harder during the continuous one. So the one, the, the one eight minute block. So they found the actual drill harder than the other two. So the intervals. Then from a physical perspective, they got, they reached sort of higher percentages of their heart rate max in the continuous one. But um, generally in the interval drills, so the shorter duration ones, you kind of get more total distance covered because the intensity is higher. They've, they've got less time, so they, they run more in those short periods. And also you're getting a greater high intensity activity. So because they're getting more rest, uh, they're going really high intensity for little blocks and then they're getting rest. So they're going, they're kind of gradually incrementing more high speed work and high intensity. So the lower, the more interval blocks are higher intensity and the more continuous are kind of... Um, uh, less that less high intensity and more sort of continuous more endurance based and then if you're looking at the technical actions uh, they found that more goals were scored in the shorter intervals so in the four times two and the two times four than a full block of eight minutes and they found that there was greater success of technical actions in the shorter periods so that's really important to consider so if you're looking to get that balance between the kind of technical and physical so you want them to be successful technically in those actions as well as physically the kind of shorter intervals give you that because they're getting more rest they're less fatigued they're not mentally fatigued as we can see from that eight minute block they're getting more rest and then able to perform to a higher intensity and better as well technically again so quickly i'm just going to flow through these these are some other rule modifications that you need to take into account really as well so if we look at for example the first one using an offside rule. So again, that's part of the game, but a lot of times in small sided games are not used, but by including that offside rule and by including an offside line, you are kind of reducing that physical demand of the session of that small sided game. Because again, like we said, it becomes more organized. So tactically players are working on pushing up the pitch a little bit more to try and trap the players. So the strikers are kind of gambling less a little bit. So you're getting less 
sort of physical intensity from it, but you're getting more game real, game realism and more tactical work really done by using an offside line. So then, for example, if you you don't use set pieces, it's a it's a game that um, Bielsa uses quite a lot. It's murder ball. They don't have set pieces, so every time the ball goes out, a coach throws it back in, or a player on the sideline throws it back in. So that intensity, physical intensity, is really high, but then it's not really game realistic in a way. It's game realistic in those short blocks, but not in terms of tactically. And well, technically they're getting more actions, but tactically they're not getting that kind of uh, changing of shape and making sure that they're reorganized defensively or offensively. So again, it's trying to find that balance of what you really want. Uh, and then again, if we're looking at goalkeepers or and using goals and end zones, um, the studies have shown that using goalkeepers actually kind of reduces the, the, the success of technical actions because of um, obviously, again, <laughs> no disrespect to any goalkeepers or coaches out there, but the, the kind of the, their ability technically is obviously going to be lower than the outfield players. So in terms of when you're adding the keeper in to either be maybe a bounce player or be in uh, the zones like in the, in the image there, the, the actual success of actions reduces slightly. So that's, again, important to consider. But then using goalkeepers is great because it's more game realistic if it's um, shooting on goal and, uh, and trying to get them involved in, the, in, in, say, ball possession games as well because they need to. It's important that they're involved as well. Like I said, with, with goals, more shooting opportunities, which is more game realistic. So, again, they're great for sort of small-sided games where you want loads of technical actions in a small, like a short period of time, so that high-intensity technical actions. Whereas end zones, you probably you get more kind of ball possession because you're gradually building up play to then find opportunities to sort of break in behind. So you're getting maybe it's more of a focus on running in behind or more tactical actions like that than really sort of more of the, the game realistic of kind of free flow. Uh, then finally, just looking at like number of touches. Again, that's from studies have shown that um, uh, using one touch is um, this actual success of technical actions is, is fairly low just because uh, the demand on players. So to be able to pass straight away first touch is difficult. So the technical actions will be lower and the success of those actions will be lower. And again, not very sort of game realistic, but the, that kind of speed of play will be important within it as well. So the one touch, if it's done well, uh, like we see in like the rondos, is really high speed of play and, and good intensity. But then um, say if we're using, they, they, they found in their study, in a study that I, uh, I saw about a number of touches, uh, they said that kind of a two-touch approach was almost the best way of doing it because you get that game speed, that really quick speed of play. So if that's what you want to work on, it's great for that, as well as the greater technical success as well. So you're getting a mixture of the two, really. Okay, so just to kind of uh, close off there towards the end, so just have a think about the key considerations of small-sided games and how we use them and how we manipulate them, really. So... For small-sided games, they're a really good tool for, for any coach, really, because you can adapt them so easily. You can change them to, to fit your needs and the needs of your session for that day. But then it's important to realise it's not a one-size-fits-all. So for something that might work for me may not necessarily work for someone else, and depending on the levels you work with. So what's important is really to think about what the aim of your session is. So am I looking to, I don't know, develop the players physically? So say it's a pre-season session is the focus of that small sided game in the session going to be more physical based or is it going to be more technical or tactical? That's up to you to decide. And really you want to look at say the theme of the day. So I, if it's a tactical theme and you want to work on a little ball possession, then you're going to maybe reduce the, the games where you're using goalkeepers and keep them more possession based. But again, it all depends on what you're looking for and, and your needs really. Then after that, so what area size and player numbers do you have? Again, that's really important. So this can change, particularly in football. I've noticed, like um, working with the academy, uh, the, the first team might want two players, and you you planned a beautiful session with the exact area sizes and pitch numbers and player numbers, everything like that. But then you could lose two players in in a second, and you've got to change it. So that's when that kind of relative area size comes into comes, comes into play. As you get to know that a little bit better and what that means, you can then adapt your pitch sizes to fit what you wanted anyway. So say if it was a, you were doing a 5v5 and you lost two players, how do you then reduce the area to, to get the same sort of pitch size um, quickly really in that session? So that's a very important aspect to think of. And then in terms of a periodization approach, so in the week, so again, depending on what level you're working with, 
in that training week, uh, uh, it really it's really important like what kind of small sided games you use during the week. So te- realistically, you're not necessarily going you're not going to do a, a big 11 v 11 45 minute game the day before a game because you don't want the players tired before the game. And likewise for the next game, and likewise you're not going to do loads of really small 1v1s, high intensity work the day before a game or the day after a game because realistically they're too tired or or they're, they're going to bring too much fatigue into the game. So it's about working out when you want to do your physical work, which generally would be more in the middle of the week, and when you want to do maybe a more tactical work, and that's more sort of towards the end of the week, um, sort of your Thursday, Friday, well, your Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, building up to the Saturday game. And then finally, what age group and level you're working with. So that's really important as well. So a, a session that might work for an elite club may not necessarily work for a recreational team or again if it's an age group thing as well it's really realizing what pitch size suits the players so again if it's a you're working with under 13s or 14s but you put a pitch size that is suitable for over 21s for example for like adults football then you need to realize that that's not going to be necessarily suitable for them and to be able to then build up really so it's better to kind of start a little bit lower work out what works for your age group, what size works for age group, and then build up from there and then add the modifications from there so you can get a bit more kind of progression as opposed to uh, kind of just chucking them into a session that they're, they're not ready for already. So again, it's all just trying to make sure to remember that small side games are really useful, but we need to make sure that we understand how to use them and what's important when, when using them as well. Okay, uh, sorry if uh, I've dragged on a little bit long there, but um, thanks for, for everything, guys. And um, if you have any questions, uh, uh, you can contact me on LinkedIn, whatever. And uh, if not, I can also check out my email as well if you need. But um, yeah, any questions, lads, uh, guys, let me know.